I want you to write this down at the top of the page. I want you to write this down that from the beginning of history, God has always desired for his people to be free. From the beginning of time, as far as we can look back, as a matter of fact, 1,600 years before Jesus took the scene, a man named Moses, the book of Exodus. Does everybody remember the story, Prince of Egypt? Moses recognized that his people, God's people, had been in slavery for 500 years. Do you remember how the story played out? Moses felt authorized by God. He went to Pharaoh. What did he look at Pharaoh famously and say? He said, Pharaoh, let my people The the overview of the book of Exodus really was a redemptive story of God seeing that his people were in prison and they needed to be set free. 1,600 years later, Jesus comes on the scene saying the same thing, same message, same... This is what he says in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 through 21. Jesus comes into this temple and they hand him a scroll the scroll of Isaiah. In those times, they would read from those scroll, scrolls in their public worship gatherings. Jesus finds the place in the book of Isaiah where it says, Luke chapter, seven, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, it says, The Spirit, he found the place on the scroll when he unfolded it, saying, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, and listen to this, and to declare freedom for prisoners. John chapter 8, verse 32, John echoed the very same idea in John chapter 8, verse 32. What did he say? He said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. free. He said three verses later, if you know the Son, the Son will set you. Free. Now you're getting the hang of it. Paul echoed this. He commanded this to the Galatians church. Fifty years after Jesus was born, Paul looks at these Galatians, and you know what he says in chapter 5, verse 1? He said, it is for freedom that Christ Set us free. And now we find ourselves in Psalm chapter 40. God has always desired for his people to live in freedom. From the beginning of time, he's had one desire. For you to be free from the weight of shame, the weight of sin, the baggage of condemnation. And for you to live your lives free. If you look at the original story in the book of Genesis, he created them weightless. No clothes, no shame, no condemnation. Why? Because he intended from creation for people to live their lives in freedom. As a matter of fact, God actually has a problem when his people live in bondage. Psalm chapter 40, this is a psalm of deliverance for David. This is David recalling, recanting. He's kind of letting the world know the deliverance that he experienced with God. Check this out, Psalm chapter 40, verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Everybody say slimy pit. How many of you been to the slimy pit a time or two? Can I see your hand? The rest of y'all are lying. Here we go. Out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. This is like David coming home from youth camp. You know what I'm saying? He's fired up. I mean, he's ready to charge hell With a water pistol. You know what I'm saying? That kind of. You remember what you did when you came home from youth camp. You burned all your secular CDs and threw your tapes out the window. You were going to live this thing. (laughs) Verses 1, 2, and 3. David is declaring the deliverance of God. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that nine verses later in verses 12 through 17. Something begins to change. His tone. The language. The tense. The pleading begins to change in David's life. I I want you to pick up with me in verses 1, 2, 3. He's ready to charge hell with a water pistol. In verses 12 through 17, it's like his girlfriend broke his heart. Listen to this language. It says at the bottom of the psalm, For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They're more than the hairs on my head. My heart fails within me. Please be... Please, be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha. How many of you have those people in your life? 
be appalled at their own shame, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. I love this last line. It's whining 101. Here we go. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and you're my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. It's interesting to me in verses 1 through 3, David is shouting from the rooftop that he has been set free and delivered by God. And in verses 12 through 17, he is saying, God, I am poor and needy. I am miserable. The people want to kill me and destroy me. My life is at the end. Would you please help? It sounds to me like David is asking to be delivered again. Does it sound like that to you? Okay, I want you to think about something because I know what you're doing. Before you go judging David about needing God to help him again, I need you to remember that you and I are not that much different from David. How many times have you picked back up and gone to the very sin that God delivered you from? How many times have we gone back to the place God told us not to go because we had to go? And when we went, we went from charging hell with a water pistol to, oh, God, save me, help me, I am in trouble. How many times have you prayed the same prayer for the same sin, for the same situation, a hundred times? Can I see your hand? Half of you. The rest of you see me after class. I need you to pray for me. You're still angry. You're still drinking. You're still looking at porn. You're still struggling. That sin, sin still remains. I just don't think we're that much different when it comes to the patterns of our lives. In a couple of verses going, God set me free. He set me on a rock. And in the next verse going, God, I need your help again. I have a confession. All right. Tim Simmons confession time. Here it is. I don't need delivery. I need constant deliverance. I don't need help getting unstuck once. I need help learning to stay unstuck. I need help learning not just to be set free. As a matter of fact... I'm about to show you something, and when I show you, it's going to make a lot of sense because it's going to resonate with your spiritual life. You're going to see it and go, I am this video. Now, it took thousands of hours of Instagram and Facebook reels for me to find it, but I have finally found a summary of Psalm chapter 40 and our spiritual lives in this video. Check this out. That's us. We're in a slimy pit. God needs to deliver us. He sets us free. He sets us on a rock. Here we go living our life. Now hold on for those of you who don't think this is you. I've actually personally got you in slow motion here in just a second. Just watch. That's where I typically end up. There it is, slow-mo. That's you right back into the place that you said you were never going to go again. Don't judge David. In three verses, he's declaring the freedom of God. And seven, eight, nine later, he's begging for help. That's the pattern of all of our lives. I don't need delivering. I need constant deliverance. I woke up this morning and I played one song every Sunday on the way to church. I need you, Lord, how I need you. Every hour, I need you. And what I've discovered is there's this big difference that sometimes, and I want you to write this down if it's in your notes, I have found that sometimes there is a difference from being set free and learning how to stay free. And I think I know why. The reason that it's, there's a difference between being set free and learning how to live our lives staying free, I think I've discovered this, write this down, it's because freedom always has fine print. Can I get a witness? Let me just tell you right now. I don't know if any of you, how many of you have ever been sabotaged by fine print? Can I see your hand? I'm convinced at Shoe Station they have never given a discount to any human on the planet. I don't care if you got a Shoe Station coupon. It won't work. 
I don't know why I'm a member at Walgreens. One of the proudest moments of my day is when I go to Walgreens and they ask me if I'm a member. And I say, yes, I am a member. Do you remember your number? For the first time, yes, I punch my number in. I am a member of Walgreens. And then I politely ask the lady for the 900th time, ma'am, am I going to receive a discount today? Now, if you don't believe Walgreens are experts at fine print, you haven't seen that receipt they print you. It's four and a half foot long. And somewhere on there, it says, if you have 300 more value points, then you can receive a discount. I just don't believe it's true. Coupons have never worked for me. I don't care how many I buy. Because every time I try to use them, there's some fine print down at the bottom that disqualifies me from the coupon discount I should receive. Freedom, now you got to listen to me because I think what ends up happening is that we want to be free but we don't read the fine print. That there's some language wrapped around spiritual freedom that we overlook and I have to tell you that fine print is what keeps many of us from staying free. There is this sacred relationship between God's grace and our work that I think oftentimes get overlooked. And it's kind of what I'm trying to explain to you. The theological term is the term sanctification. Paul said it better than anyone in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 10, when he talked about this grace and this work and how it should work together. He said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Listen to this language. No, I worked Harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Do you see this tension, this balance of it's God's grace that's working in me. He set me free, but I also worked harder than anyone else, not just so I could be set free, but so that I could learn to stay free. I want to do something for you. I want to do a re- I want to rewind and go back to the very part of this message. And I want to read some fine print that I did not read for you the first time. Do you remember when I told you that at 1,600 years before Jesus came onto the scene, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says this famous phrase. Moses, seeing that his people were in prison for 500 years, he looks at Pharaoh and he says, Let my people go. And you want to know something miraculous? That's exactly what he did. God actually set his people free. He performed miracles to set the, the Israelites free from Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He sent them on their way. What I did not tell you is that once they crossed the Red Sea and they were set free, they spent 40 years in the wilderness wandering, complaining, lost, penalized because of their disobedience. Some of the people who had been set free in the book of Exodus actually looked at Moses and said, Moses, can we go back to being in prison? We had better meals there. Some of you listen to me closely. I know the temptation for you to go back to the rotten place that you came from because you think your friends will treat you better or that something better will happen. It will not. Sometimes there's a difference between being set free and learning how to stay Free. Remember when I told you in John chapter 8, verse 32, there was that really powerful verse that's easy to preach? If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. What I did not tell you is that in John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says to this to his disciples, If you hold to my teachings, then you are my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you you free. Do you see that fine print in verse 31? That fine print says you have to be consistently obedient to God to experience his freedom. Remember I told you in Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 I said to you that it is for freedom that Christ set us free. What I did not tell you is the fine print. If you look at the rest part B of that verse Galatians 5 1 says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand Firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Do you hear the tension? Be free, do not let yourself. I think that ought to be, somebody ought to get a tattoo. That's how they live their spiritual life. God set me free, I better not let myself go back to where I came from. It's one thing to be set free. It's another thing to learn to live our lives To stay free. And then we find ourselves, Psalm chapter 40. 
And in Psalm chapter 40, we find ourselves getting to the place where David is saying this beautiful psalm, the verse three verses. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he pulled me out of a slimy pit, and he put me on the, he pulled me out of the mud and the mire, and he set my place, feet on a solid rock and gave me a place to stand, and he put a new song in my mouth of praise. I want to spend about seven or eight minutes helping you see the fine print of Psalm chapter 40, these three verses. Look at verse 1, part A. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. How many of you know we ain't got to stop? We can just stop preaching right there and go home. Can I tell you something? God will come through for you, but God is going to come through on his time, not on your time. I need you to know something about the timing of God. Sometimes God will use chronology. He will use time to patiently refine and test the faith that you need to be having to believe in God. Sometimes when you think it's midnight, it's only 930. In the Bible, midnight is kind of this moment where you think it's Ichabod, it's over, it is finished, I'm done. How many of you have been to midnight? And then you survived at 2 a.m. You know what I'm saying? You made it. That's because it was only 9.30. It wasn't midnight. We're on God's time. We're not on your time. Sometimes all we do, listen to me closely because you need to hear this about staying free. Sometimes the very best thing you can do is to wait on God. He will come through. I would bet my life. I've spent my entire adult life making one bet. And it is the bet that if we preach God is all powerful and good, that he would come through for you, that he would deliver you, that he would be there for you, that he would set you free. It's just you got to remember, David waited patiently. And I think some of us have to wait patiently on the Lord. God will come through. We must wait. Look at part B of the next verse. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. And I want you to listen to me. If you're watching online, if you're inside our cafe or our outdoor auditorium, I want you to know that God hears you, that he is listening. He's not, he, he's not in some distant place ignoring your struggles, your pain. He's not at some distant place not paying attention to where you are. I need you to know if you're at Coastal Church this weekend in any place, and you're not sure that you believe that Jesus deeply loves you, I want to reassure you that Jesus loves you deeply and he is listening to you intently. David said it this way, he turned and he heard my cry. Now I want you to listen to me closely because I need you to know something about the power of our confession. You cannot be healed of the things that you refuse to confess. Now, the fine print of this part of the verse is this. He listens for you. You need to be talking to him. God is attentive to your needs, but he's not attentive to silence. He's attentive to you crying out. In this particular passage, David had to speak. The big idea is this. God is listening. We must speak. I cannot tell you the biblical precedent set on the power of confession. The book of Proverbs actually says that physical surroundings change by the power of your words. If you are a husband, you already know that all too well and good. You come in that house and look at your wife and say, baby, you are fantastic. You are wonderful. You are amazing. There's a glorious spirit that fills your home. Can I get a witness? If you come in your house and say, baby, did you, what did you, did you clean today at all? The spirit of death quickly encapsulates that place. And there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> There's so much power in our confession. But what I have discovered is that a lot of us want God to read our minds and he can read our minds. It's not that God doesn't know what you're thinking. He's waiting on you to confess your sin, your struggle, your situation so that at that moment he can turn to you, he can listen to you, and he can act on your behalf. There is power in our confession. He is listening. The fine print is we must. Let's keep going through the verses. It goes on to say that he lifted me out of a slimy pit. He pulled me out of the mud and the mire. I want you to hear me closely because I also believe that God is a deliverer. That if you're here this weekend at Coastal Church, you're watching online. 
and you have an issue, a struggle, an addiction, a habit, something inside of you that is beyond your control, that you've tried. I believe that our God is a forgiving, delivering, free-setting God. And you have to just cry out to him. And listen to me, and I want you to hear me closely. When you repent and you ask God to forgive you of the sin that you're struggling with, you have to know that at that moment, God's forgiveness is activated in your life fully and completely. This weekend, if you leave this place, did you know that you could leave this place 100% right with Jesus? No shame, no condemnation, no sin that gets between you and God. That you could actually walk out of this place free. I want you to know that this sign in the psalm to me was, was a moment where we were seeing the delivering power of God that he set he pulled me out of the muck and the mire, and he pulled me out of a slimy pit. Keep looking at the verses. The next verse is really important because the next verse says that he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. Now, I could stay here all day, but I want you to hear something about this fine print. I know that when God delivers you, he typically gives you, he regularly gives you a place to stay a place to grow, and a firm footing for you to take your stance. Here's what I've discovered. There's too many people that come to Coastal Church, they get their lives set free, they get their lives in order, and they get good and proud of themselves, and they're just like that sheep, I think I'm going to live my life. And they walk away and say, I think I'll go back to the place that I came from. I'm better now. I think this Psalm of David is saying, when God sets you free, he gives you a firm place to stand. That firm place is not the bar that you used to frequent in your old life. That firm place is not the place that that relationship that you were entangled and entrapped in. That firm place is God's house showing up, staying free. Every Thursday night, I want to tell you something because I know that there are people within the sound of my voice who have private struggles that no one knows about. Every Thursday night at 6.30, I gather with a group of friends right here on this plaza. The first thing we do is we have dinner and we just talk about our week. The next thing we do is we pick up a guitar and we sing worship because we know that we are inviting God's presence into the moment. The next thing that happens is someone who is celebrating staying free. Someone who has overcome their addiction and their struggle, they step up and they give a testimony about how God set them free and they stayed free. And then after about 15 minutes, the guys come out on the plaza and the ladies stay in there. And I sit with men every Thursday night at 6.30 and we just have conversation about what it means to stay free. If you're here this weekend and you say, Pastor Tim, I'm in that moment and I cannot break what has a hold on me? I want to invite you to be a part of the family that I'm very proud to be a part of, and it's called Celebrate Recovery. And every single Thursday night at 6.30, there are people who have figured out it's one thing to be set free. It's another thing to learn how to stay free. And we gather together, and it's executives and painters and hunters and fishermen, and it's all people from all walks of life with all kinds of struggles, and we sit and encourage each other in the Lord saying, we're going to live our lives free. The last thing it says, the, the principle is God sets our feet on a solid place. We must stand firm. And then lastly, he put a song in my mouth and a hymn of praise to our God. I want to tell you something. God wants to give you a new language, a new vocabulary. He wants to fill that heart with praise. But every single Sunday and every Monday through Friday that you get up, it's your responsibility to sing. When we started this series on Psalms, we knew we were moving outside. And I don't know if you know this or not, but at Coastal Church, we are to some degree intentional. We knew that we would find ourselves in the book of Psalms on June the 11th at 119 degrees. 300 degrees humidity. And our thing was, could we teach people to worship Jesus in any environment possible. Amen. And so here we are. And I just want to tell you, freedom has fine print. It's one thing to be set free. It's another thing to be able to live and learn how to stay free. I want to encourage you to do something. I'm going to pray for every single person, and our host is going to come. But if you're here this weekend with every head bowed and every eye closed, you can remain seated. 
I'm really passionate about seeing people's lives free. I have friends and family and people in my world that have been devastated by the grip of staying in the pit. And if you're here this weekend, I want to ask two very simple questions that you're here this weekend. And the first question to you is this. Tim, I've never cried out to God to rescue and save my soul from my sin. And today, I sense the presence of the Holy Spirit filling my life. And I want to become a follower of Jesus today. When I count to three, I want you to do something really courageous. If you're here this weekend, you say, Tim, I want to make a decision to follow Christ today. When I count to three, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. Awesome. The second question that I have for every person is you say, Tim, I'm in the middle of a struggle, a situation that is beyond my control, and I'm ready to read the fine print, to cry out to God, to do the work of being set free and staying free. When I count to three, I want you to lift up your hands. One, two, three. That's me. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to pray for every single person. I want you to do something before I pray. I want you to remember to take those connect cards and leave us a response. Check that salvation. Check that recommitment. Check that prayer box. Because this is just the first step for us. We want to walk with you every step of the way. I'm going to pray. We're going to give Jesus a big round of applause and our host will come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that a lot of people see the power of not just being set free, but learning to stay free. I pray for every single person here that we would walk out of this place free of shame, free of sin, free of condemnation. And I thank you that you're going to help us walk in freedom because that's what you've always intended for us to do. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name.